so let's uh, continue with this story now and to speak more on this and other weather alerts around the country, let's now uh, bring in Professor Guy Midgley, Professor and Director of the School for Climate Studies at Stellenbosch University. Prof, thank you so much uh, for your time this afternoon. So now we know there's a level five warning for disruptive snowfall uh, in the Western Cape and of course other provinces also have some uh, form of an alert. It sounds a bit extreme for snow in spring. I mean, we are now um, going into October. Perhaps talk to us about what we can attribute some of these climate patterns, um, you know, in the country that are making these harsh weather conditions more severe. It's a very good question. Thanks very much for having, having me. Well, it looks as though this can be partly attributed to uh, unusual warming above the Antarctic continent itself. And interestingly enough, when there is warming above the Antarctic continent, it sets up a situation in which a cold air can move further north or further towards the equator and give us these sorts of conditions. So ironically, the extra cold weather that we're getting is related to extra warming over the Antarctic continent. And that destabilizes the normal situation where that where cold air is kept closer to the subantarctic continent so it's quite a interesting situation mm. i mean we saw how just a few days ago you know uh, many people including disaster teams were not prepared for the heavy snowfall and the storms that we saw what improvements can be made in firstly uh, forecasting and secondly, in probably disaster preparedness, especially when you consider the, in, you know, the context of climate related disasters. Well, a couple of things. I, I think the forecasting was absolutely on point. Mm. So our, our weather services did a very, very good job of pre advance warning. Uh, and it's really the, the process from that to implementation, which really needs work. So, for example, uh, given the warning of snow, it might have been it might have been useful for disaster management, say, to have closed off some roads or restricted access to roads or prepared a little bit better uh, to anticipate cars getting getting stuck, and we may well have avoided some of the worst outcomes. But it's a question of trust, and you know, weather services isn't always going to get it right. But they do, I think they get it right enough times for us to start thinking now about putting things in place to prevent disasters rather than just respond to disasters. Mm. And Prof, just in light of climate change, you know, now being uh, more real than ever, how then do we begin or should we have already started just taking disaster proofing our cities, especially in areas uh, with low lying areas like in, in Gauteng, like we saw in our previous report in the Yakske River and some parts of KwaZulu-Natal, where, where then do we start taking this seriously and, and, and proofing our cities against these disasters? I, I think that it's a great question. I think that we, we, we must use these disaster conditions to learn very fast about how to adapt to climate change because these events are teaching us, it's, it's really the first signs of climate change really impacting on human society here. And the faster we learn from it, the better we're going to build up the ability to, to adapt, tolerate and overcome these challenges. So investing in better weather services, uh, more advanced warning, the, the right actions to prevent uh, bad things from happening, be they uh, you know, closing roads or whatever the case may be, getting uh, supplies in early enough, and really moving people away from dangerous zones like drainage lines, because we've seen uh, simple little drainage lines turning into raging rivers very, very quickly, and that's very scary and danger dangerous for human life. Um, but as I say, we are learning and we have to use these events as learning uh, opportunities and, and also learn how to recover from them better so they don't, they don't happen as badly next time. There's a lot of stuff we can learn from these things and we need to do it very, very deliberately. 
And considering, uh, Prof, that, you know, there are multi-departments, multi-stakeholders that essentially are responsible for some of the, you know, the, the, the comments that you've just made in terms of the responsibilities, where then do we start? I mean, who then leads the charge? We've got the weather services, we've got the department um, of, um, you know, of COGTA uh, that manages these disaster management areas. We've got the human settlements department, etc. cetera. Uh, where do you see this uh, starting? It's a great point. Uh, you know, government works easiest and best when you have a hierarchy uh, and things are split up into, you can call them silos, independent lines of reporting. And that is a real weakness when it comes to these sorts of events that cut across the different nat you know, natural silos. So what climate change is teaching us is that we have to start think thinking in a more connected way and uh, communicating across these departments in a more connected way. And that means you need people in those roles that really know what they're doing. You need a lot of expertise. You have to fund them very, very well. There need to be career paths and there need to be very clear paths of communication which transcend the, na the normal, you know, line manager processes. So that's why it's a big challenge for government because governments don't like operating like that. Yeah. <laughs> Prof, thank you so much uh, for your time though. Really, I do appreciate some of your insights, uh, Professor and Director of the School for Climate Studies at the Stellenbosch University, Professor Guy Midgley, there for us. All right, uh, we'll continue with more of your news.